Hello everybody, I'm Mike from the Rewatch Project podcast and I am a Star Trek fan watching Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who no less, for the first time. If you're new to the show, I am an absolute Doctor Who novice. I know little to nothing about the show apart from what I just gleaned from the pop cultural zeitgeist back in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up and I am working my way through all of the classic era Doctor Who from uh, William Hartnell right through to uh, the end of the Sylvester McCoy run, and maybe even beyond, who knows. Uh, so yes, I've been learning a lot. Uh, I've, I've been getting some great commentary on the uh, YouTube channel. You can also email me at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com. And that reminds me, please also do check out the Rewatch Project podcast, uh, which unlike this show is where I watch TV shows with my wife that I've seen before, mainly geeky TV. And we tell uh, you, the listener, what we have made about them on this watch. Uh, apologies for the brief gap between the end of the Marco Polo serial and uh, this new serial. Uh, work's been a little bit crazy for the last couple of weeks, so I treated myself to a week off. But I am back and I am looking forward to getting into Doctor Who. So without further ado, let's move on. Uh, we are now on to The Sea of Death, the first episode of the Keys of Marinus uh, serial. Again, as is the case with all of these things, I know absolutely nothing about this. Apparently, we are back to regular episodes after the uh, interesting experiment of uh, the reconstruction of the Marco Polo serial, which I actually really enjoyed. I think it's a testimony to the quality of that, that it translated so well. But it is quite nice to be back watching uh, moving images again. So here we are, first episode of The Keys of Marinus. Uh, what will this lifelong Star Trek fan think of this nearly 60-year-old episode of television? Let's find out. Yeah, we didn't really get a kind of Quantum Leap-esque next adventure cliffhanger there. Nice little bit of science fiction design there. Bit of Neo-Aztec. Terry Nation. Okay, there's a name I recognize. He wrote the um, Daleks serial a couple of serials back. I think he wrote some of the books. Did he write some of the books as well? I used to um, frequent the, uh, the geek film tv tie-in section at bookshops a lot you know but reading star wars and star trek and x-files books and all that kind of good stuff um and i'd always see the doctor who ones as well i mean that's an interesting thing as well i mentioned that i've never really been a doctor who fan but i've been around fandom throughout the 70s and 80s so i think i've absorbed quite a lot about doctor who just through pure osmosis but uh but here we are and look what a delightful toho-esque uh miniature setup we've got here again the uh Love it. I love, it's got such charm. And I don't mean that condescendingly. Oh, this is nice because they're in there. Um, well, Ian, at least, is in his Marco Polo outfit. So I'm actually getting to see elements of that in live action, um, which feels like a treat. You know, it's just I've, I've kind of just had my first Doctor Who geek shiver, which is nice. I guess this is growing on me. I think maybe I'm maybe I'm a fan <laughs> Maybe I'm a Doctor Who fan now. I'm not sure. Certainly a classic Doctor Who fan. Cultural reference there. Well, one thing sure, we're not at South End. Can we? Enjoy themselves. Oh, tricky, tricky dialogue there. Oh, we're into a real sci-fi here. I mean, this feels. Was Flash Gordon esque? Father, do you think it's safe to go for a swim? Oh, no, 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 not at all. No. How inviting that water looks. We don't know what sort of creatures might be lurking beneath its surface. Well, diseases. It's nice to be seeing these characters moving again. Oh. Nice flippers there. Das instead of sand, eh? Intriguing. Intriguing, my boy. <laughs> oh, he loves it. It's, I love how we kind of just inspired both positively and negatively by knowledge the doctor is you know he'll he'll risk everybody's lives for a little bit of knowledge but also he'll kind of childishly you know with the excitement of a schoolboy um celebrate knowledge as well when it presents itself it's kind of it's uh, it's his thing well, was the glass put here deliberately and if so why mm? Mm. gleeful Oh, Susan. Must be some sort of acid. But it was so fast. It just seemed to dissolve. And I was going to paddle it. 
It's all right, Susan. It's all right. That would not have been nice. Look, you've got some more shoes back at the ship. I like this idea as well that, you know, I mean, everything's trying to kill them. You know, I mean, again, coming at this from a Star Trek fan's perspective where, you know, the galaxy is a playground of discovery. Uh, you know, space is a really dangerous place that's essentially designed to kill people. We're not meant to be there. Um, so I like the idea that, you know, these environments are just, can be completely inhospitable. Well, go and put them on. We'll wait here for you. Here. All right. You better take my boots. I can't put those on. They're much too big for me. Ah, come on. It's better than cutting your feet open on this glass. All right. Yeah. Oh, he's Marco Polo boots. All right. Give you a lovely. Also, I guess one of the the downsides um, or charm, again, depending on how you you decide you decide to perceive this, is the live production creates a difficulty when it comes to folly. You know, they can't really replace the sound. Everything, for the most part, has to be captured live. So if you're on a set that's meant to look like crystal or stone um but you're clomping around on wood and polystyrene it's going to sound like that and i think that's something that you kind of need to expect but again you can decide to either be sneery about that and uh, have the pomposity of a modern audience member or you can accept the fact that this was a huge achievement to do this all and was on the vanguard and you know was would be incredibly influential to all of the things that now have the benefit of being spoilt a little bit with modern production techniques including modern doctor who as well so i think that it irks me when people look at things like the original doctor who and the original star trek and just dismiss it i just think that's really it's really ignorant then everything out there is acid too a sea of acid maybe leave can they? I'm trying to remember. Is it? Are they just randomly jumping around now, or I'm just trying to remember what the actual motivator is for where they're going and how long they're staying? Uh, I'm sure that's been mentioned, and I'm just forgetting that. So, uh, yeah. Just being honest about my own ignorance here. It looks like a glass torpedo. What a one-man submarine. It's certainly designed for going under the water. Under acid, more likely. Acid frogmen? Is this what we what we got going on here? Oh. Frog prince. Oh, he's cool looking. Looks like a Fortnite character. That's a great design, that is. Again, you know, I, I keep talking about letting these things go, but I think we should celebrate them as well. You know, there is something... I mentioned before Invaders from Mars, the, the great alien invasion uh, film from the 50s, the great paranoia-drenched one. And, you know, the, the, the head of the aliens is this head in a glass ball, and the Martians are these kind of weird green guys in zip-up, what, what I meant to be skin, but is essentially zip-up green jumpsuits with, like, tennis balls cut in half of their eyes. And... Not only, you know, should you not dismiss that as being naff, I think you should celebrate it for the kind of dreamlike surreality that the production shortcomings give it. It's a benefit. You know, it's often when all of the rough edges are shaved off something, so is the humanity and the tactility and the foibles and the things that make it great and unique and um, that make you dream, you know, particularly when you watch it as a child. And this design that we saw here of this creature or of his costume um, is great. It's dripping with imagination. I mean, seeing that in, you know, 1964 or 65 or whenever this aired um, would have been wonderful. It's a protective suit. Oh, okay. Yes, and whatever it was wore it, it was similar to a human being. Hmm? Hmm? But how did it get out? Later, perhaps, uh, a little visiting, I think. Yes. <laughs> I love his almost Yoda-esque amused chuckles. Mm -hmm. Great sense of scale, design. I, mean, I know this was written by the same writers as the Daleks, and there are similarities here, 
you know, both hard sci-fi, both, um, you know, landing in a mysterious place and trying to figure out what's going on. But also the aesthetic design elements, that kind of Germanic expressionism seems to be back. Yup. You know, switch your own. I mean, just show a model and then have them have a close up for scale context and, you know, your brain buys it. Distribution of weights. That's the key, isn't it? Yes. It's marvellous, isn't it? Yes. Well, now, marvelous. before you two get carried away, I think we'd better go and find Susan. Hmm? Yes, you're quite right. Well, for a start... Again, history and science together again. Again, it's like Indiana Jones. Don't, don't lean on anything. The playability of this show. So much of the show is sneaking around and infiltrating and hiding and running and chasing. You know... That, that is extremely playable. You know, that is a real playground friendly activity. And, you know, I can see why kids would get brought into this and would bring that play into the playground in the 60s and the 70s. Sorry for Susan, of course. Well, I am sure. Yes, but where's the doctor? I mean, even if he'd been travelling at half speed, he should have reached that far corner by now. Right. Oh, hello. Oh, creepy. Oh, hide behind the sofa, kids. What? I said she's probably back at the ship waiting for us. Oh, is he gone as well? Bloody hell, they need to just tie themselves to each other. Oh, there she goes. I think you can see somebody push the door there. Let me have a look. Let me go back a little bit. Just over there on the left of the screen. Yep, there's the hand. Love it. And just so nobody gets bent out of shape, when I make fun of these little things, you know, I feel I'm keeping it in the family. Although I am new to Doctor Who, um, often, you know, I'll make fun of elements of Star Trek and things like that, but it is, it is keeping it in the family. It's like, I'm allowed to do it, we're allowed to do it. But if it comes from outside, uh, hey, you know, you leave our show alone, okay? <laughs> They died, and we are only prisoners. Love that posture he has. Maybe we are to be killed too. Oh, hey, how do you know you're helping the good guy? I mean, admittedly, they should wear less evil-looking scuba suits if they want to engender sympathy. Oh dear. Is that the first person that Ian's killed? Are you a prisoner here? Yeah. To penetrate the walls. The Vord? The man you just saved me from was a Vord. It's many years since the last assault. The Vord. Good slidey door. Again, great design in this episode. I like that low hum they've got going. All our knowledge culminated in the manufacture of this. At the time, it was called the conscience. Of Marinus. Marinus, that is the name of our planet. At first, this machine was simply a judge and jury that was never wrong and unfair. That's very Star Trek. They no longer had to decide what was wrong or right. The machine. Hey, hi, run amok. So, again, this is my Star Trek brain thinking, but this is one of those classic, great science fiction moral, moral quandaries. You know, like Clockwork Orange almost. It's, you know, on the surface, being able to eliminate all negative aspects from people, but that is a form of mind control, uh, you know, the clockwork orange of it. Uh, and also, you know, and this is something that Star Trek covered a lot later, I should point out, that sometimes it can be those negative impulses that drive us, you know, ambition and jealousy and fear and anger um, and indignation 
you know, these can drive us to in achieve incredible things, you know, uh, World War II, um, Black Lives Matter, you know, all of these things um, ultimately come from emotions that can be seen as being negative, but that can be utilized for positive social change. Um, I'll be interested to see if they get into this at all or whether they just take a more simplistic approach, which is fine. Um, but these are the things I think as a Star Trek fan, you start watching. Uh, and I've got to point out as well, I know I get the chronology wrong. This episode, I think, is from 65. So this is the year before Star Trek even aired, although Star Trek did start production in late 64 with its failed initial pilot, The Cage. But, you know, when I say, hey, this is like Star Trek, I, I, I realise that that's, um, you know, incorrect. Uh, and that if anything, it's the other way around. I don't think necessarily Star Trek was influenced by Doctor Who. I think that they were, you know, produced close enough uh, time-wise that uh, I don't think one really factored in the other, at least not in whilst the original Star Trek was on the air from 66 to 69. I think that, um, you know, they were very much in their own lane. But, um, but it's interesting to think about. For seven centuries we crossed. What did you do with them? One of them I kept. What's your head, mate? They have never returned. Keys of Marinus. You must find the keys for me. Oh, yeah, couldn't possibly, mate. Ian, wait a minute. Hmm? The doctor's miles behind. Oh. <laughs> well, well, don't just stand there. Come along, come along, keep me waiting. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a hypocrite. Force field. Some sort of invisible barrier. Oh, he gets to do a bit of mime acting here. Great stuff. I'm sorry you forced me into keeping you from your ship. He's not taking it lying down. Force field, your ship will be available to you when you return. If we return. I know we have no choice, but this whole affair is outrageous. Blackmail. Blackmail. It's egregious. I love, I love when he gets all pissed off and indignant. Um, he's just, he can't dial it down. You can see Ian just like, mate, look, it is what it is. We're in this situation. Let's just deal with it. And the doc's just, he's just not letting it go. If you think I'm going to travel across that acid sea in one of these primitive uh, submersibles, you're very much mistaken. Oops. It just adds to the realism, those flubs, to be honest. I mean, I'd, I'd struggle with that sentence in conversation. Get to beam up. Beam across. Again, it's, you know, you're talking the doctor's language now, aren't you? Uh, you know, as soon as you're showing something, I mean, look at his, look at his little face there. Uh, as, as soon as you start talking about anything scientific or educational, he just, he just perked right up. Destination, you have only to twist the dial once. Like this? Oh. Mm, look out, dude. <laughs> oh, how exhilarating. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. Where's Barbara? She should be here now. Barbara? Barbara? They just can't stay together, can they? There's blood on it. The Velvet Web. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, you can tell that it's the same writer as the Daleks episode. It's, it's very much... Uh, there's a lot of similarities, you know. I mean, it's science fiction. There's a bit of a mystery, uh, a kind of a dead planet. Um, two kind of essentially warring factions that they get pulled into. Um, you know, a little bit of convolution around the mythology of the keys. Uh, I'm not sure I'm completely following it, but basically it looks like it's a kind of a side quest story in some ways. You know, you've got to go and you've got to get these things to do this thing. You know, it's very much a kind of a MacGuffin chase, but I'm all up for that. You know, I've talked before about how one of the great things about Doctor Who is the elasticity of the concept. And I'm a big science fiction fan, so I'm glad to see them getting back into science fiction territory. And uh, yeah, I'll be back soon with the next episode, The Velvet Web. I'm not sure how many parts this storyline is. As I say, I try to kind of remain as ignorant as possible, as pure as possible. But one of the things about reacting to something is, of course, you know, I do pause it from time to time, but I'm also talking over it as well. So I probably maybe miss a few details that I wouldn't miss if I was just sitting in my lounge watching this. 
So if I have missed anything or if I've got anything wrong or I'm going down the wrong path, uh, happy to be corrected or get any kind of context. So, uh, yeah, really enjoying Doctor Who, really enjoying the storyline. Glad to be back with moving pictures again. And I will be back with the next episode of Velvet Web very soon. Bye-bye.